All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome um, to the first lecture in the Urban Computation Lecture Series. We'll kick off in a minute or two, just while our attendees list here populates and more and more people join. It's great. We're already past 40 people, which is incredible. I always like to go through the attendees list and call out names of people I know. Linda, how's it going? I can't hear you or see you, but no. But I say hello. I see all, I did promise my students that I am going to take attendance <laughs> uh, to make sure that they're all here. So I am gonna go through the names. All right, look, we have a lot of people. Let's kick things off. Nice. Um, Thanks. Thanks. Uh, let me just, I'm going to turn off the live transcripts just because this is a new feature that Zoom seems to have triggered without telling anyone. And I'll share my screen. All right. So welcome everyone to Urban Computation Lecture Series. This is the third or fourth year. I forget. Maybe the first year I didn't really tell anyone about it, but this is the third kind of international series that I'm running as part of the studio at the School of Architecture here at UTS um, and um, uh, part of the master's program. Before I kick off, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Iora nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus at UTS now stands. I would like to also respect, uh, to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. I would further like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various ancestral lands from which our attendees are joining us today and to pay respects to those elders past and present. So a quick overview of the series. It's a jam-packed series, I think, with a lot of amazing talks. Of course, I'm going to say that because um, I'm the one who asked people to come in, but we're kicking off with an excellent talk from Matt and Josh from Arab, which I'll introduce in a second. But uh, please take a note of the upcoming series. So it's, uh, we have a lecture every week um, and then we take for three weeks, then we take one week break and then another three weeks uh, after that. So please be sure to join those um, um, lectures. But enough of the future and let's look at today. And so today we have the awesome, the great and the fabulous Matt and Josh. So I'll introduce Matt to begin with. Matt uh, Gevers shares the urban design leader role in Arab Sydney office. Um, Matt joined Sydney quite uh, recently. So please, whoever is in Australia, give him a very warm welcome. Um, he recently transferred to Sydney and was chief urban designer for Arab in Hong Kong, where he combined his work at Arab with his role as adjunct assistant professor at the School of Architecture in the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where I originally met him. He has over 14 years experience in complex integrated planning and design projects. He has worked in multiple scales from large scale strategic master plans to streetscape enhancements. He has a particular interest in combination between landscape and urban design. A lot of people at TTS maps are gonna love that sentence. <laughs> so if there's any landscape architects in from UTS in the attendees, um, Matt is your guy. Um, Matt has led the strategic planning and design on high profile public and private sector projects in Europe, Middle East, Asia, delivering the spatial planning for projects in Hong Kong, mainland China, Macau, Taiwan, and several locations in Southeast Asia. Projects range from economic master plans and new town plans to detailed urban design guidelines and precinct design. He has a long track record in leading master plans for development banks in Asia Pacific, including projects for the ADB and the World Bank Group. Tremendous, tremendous to have you. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining. Um, Thanks. Joining Matt today is uh, Josh, Young or Joshua Young. Um, uh, Josh is an urban designer with an interest in how computational design can enhance our understanding of cities and the way they evolve. He has experience developing urban analysis toolkits, planning frameworks and guidelines, precinct master planning, schematic design and feasibility testing. His experience spans across various sectors, including public domain, infrastructure, education, commercial, and health. And I'm so keen to hear what you have to say, Josh, about all those toolkits that you've developed. I'm very keen, as you can imagine, being a software developer to know more about what people are doing, but especially in practice. So thank you again, Josh, for joining. Super excited to have you guys talk. So 
I'm not going to talk anymore because everyone is joining to listen to you guys. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, before I do that, however, um, for the attendees, um, please feel free to put in any questions you might have in the Q&A section in the chat um, uh, or save them to the end if you would like to ask questions at the end. Uh, today's format is going to be a 45-minute presentation, more or less, followed by a 15-minute Q&A. I always find that the Q&A section and the discussion is super interesting. So if you have anything to contribute, please do not hesitate. Please contribute and uh, share your thoughts or questions with the presenters. Once again, Matt and Josh, thank you so much for joining and over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Mohammed. Thanks for the invitation and uh, uh, really happy to be part of this series and, and, uh, and, and this kind of discussions that are going on here. Uh, as, as you mentioned, it's very new for me. Uh, I'm learning the Australian environment. Uh, uh, please bear with me while I learn. Um, but we've uh, set together a, a series of slides uh, of uh, tools that we have been working with, methodologies that we've been developing um, across different regions in Arab. Uh, and avoiding to, to make it a, a showcase of and this and that and that and that tool, uh, we'll talk a bit uh, broader about methodologies and how toolkits can be applied and the role of the designer in that process, uh, which, I, which I think is a, is a very important discussion to have, especially when we talk about digitalization of the design environment. Um, thanks, Josh, for, uh, for running the slides. Uh, we keep it very simple. We talk about three things today. Uh, one is data. The other one is data the design process and how data relates to the design process, how we're changing the way that we're working uh, and application or applications, the application of those thinkings uh, into uh, the design process or the use of applications uh, while we work with them. Um, and we go in, in a bit of detail uh, uh, through each of them. Uh, first, starting with data and I think Many of us know already uh, a lot about data and what's going on, uh, but we do want to look a bit about the diversity of data uh, that exists, the role that it can play for, in this case, urban designers or perhaps architects, uh, in the way we think about cities, the way we think about uh, what is a, a good design or a bad design. Um, how do we use data to drive any decision making, uh, because that's the key element that we want to discuss today. Uh, and of course, what's the role of the designer or the architect or the urban designer or the landscape designer within that decision making process? Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, I want to start actually really simple with something very different. Uh, this is, um, I'll probably say it wrong, but it's the inauguration ceremony of Pope Benedict uh, in 2005. Uh, it's a great slide, um, uh, if you think, uh, in 2005, uh, it, which is only 17 years ago. Um, this was a major event, and that major event was recorded in its own way with television cameras, etc., broadcasted around the world. Um, but if you go to the next slide, um, we look at the inauguration of Pope Francis. And this is uh, seven years later uh, after uh, Pope Benedict. And you see that technology has played a major role in changing the way we think about um, major events in our society and the way we interpret them the way we respond to those things and the way we record, the way we collect our information. And this is really uh, an essential thing because that's only a period of seven years. And uh, maybe later on where well, we can have a discussion uh, on uh, I think the role that, uh, that education has in terms of educating new architects or new designers. Uh, it took me 10 years to graduate from my university uh, uh, I was a bit slow in that, but think what kind of change actually happened only in that 10 years, which is uh, uh, very important to be able to reflect upon that, especially if we do 
um, things like city planning or town planning, when we think maybe 20 years ahead or sometimes even 30 years ahead around strategic developments of, let's say, for instance, how city uh, cities are developing uh, in the region, the greater Sydney plans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and technology, understanding of technology and trends in technology play a major role uh, in providing a proper response to that question. Next slide, please. Uh, and one of the lessons we had around this actually really, really recent ago. And um, while it is a bit of a sidetrack to talk again about COVID, uh, it is an interesting uh, event seen from a digital point of view. Uh, because it is the first time that we actually were uh, more or less able to record events and progression of uh, um, the pandemic uh, in, in a way that we deal with data. Uh, I think on the next slide, please. It's not the first time that we in the world come across an event like this. This is a, a, a graph from... Uh, New York City uh, that records the different epidemics that it went through. Um, but on the next slide, uh, and, and uh, the changes that it brought to the way we think about healthcare, for instance, in cities or sanitation in cities. Uh, but it is the first time that we, and I think you're all familiar with this kind of dashboard, whether it is this one or another kind of dashboard, uh, we are able to understand almost real time what was happening in the last uh, three years across the world. And this is a major shift uh, in the way we deal with information and the way we can actually think about uh, our cities and the influence of having real time or near real time information to our city design. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is going through a process that is changing rapidly, right? This is uh, the, the Strava heat map. Uh, uh, quite uh, familiar images, I think, for, for perhaps some of you, uh, where uh, data is recorded of runners and cyclists all around the world, uh, um, recorded into uh, geospatial mapping uh, environments so that it is retrievable. And think of all the different lessons that can be learned by having uh, this near real time or, or aggregated data uh, sets uh, um, around uh, uh, activity areas uh, available uh, for understanding the, the needs and requirements of upgrades in our city. Uh, and this is only one example, uh, uh, this data set, but there are tons of similar data sets that actually play a major role in changing the way we think uh, and deal with information around which we make decisions. Uh, decisions that influence uh, the way we think about what is the right outcome for our proposal that we're making. Uh, and it shifts, it sets a shift in terms of uh, thinking of the role of the designer uh, as the mastermind behind determining what is good or bad towards a more evidence-based process. The next slide, please. I think, Joyce, you, you want to take over here, right? Yeah, yeah thanks. <clears throat> um, yeah, just recently on the news, uh, I saw this um, footage. It's, uh, it's a tower, two towers actually in India that were demolished. Um, and uh, then obviously reading through the article, I discovered that those towers are basically brand new, not even finished yet. And the reason for them to be demolished was because they breached planning um, controls and um, a series of other uh, safety related issues as well. Um, but just looking at this, this scene here, I guess what was required for this to happen was um, a, a huge evacuation of, uh, of this area and then um, you know, quite an operation given how close it was to other buildings. Um, and it brings the question to me around uh, how decisions are made. And um, sorry, I'll just go to the next slide. Um, let me. Yeah, there we go. Um, 
but it, yeah, it brings to me the question around, um, I guess, how, how decisions are made. And in this case, it was a legal framework that the decisions a cause for this building to be demolished for this structure that wasn't even complete yet to be demolished but um how would that be different if it was maybe if there was a data uh led approach to that decision making framework um how what kind of different outcome would have occurred if we had a data um the data of say the embedded um, carbon that was in that structure or the the impacts that that might cause to to the surrounding community or what the potential for that structure could be for other uses if it was if those other concerns were resolved um and so it starts to it starts to um lead to the question around um how will and how has data impacted the decision making process of of in in which we operate in as architects um this here is the uh, just the mapping that's showing up here is the the input mapping and data from the city of Sydney's central planning strategy in 2016, um, <clears throat> and uh, this is an example of um, where data is directly impacting how planning um, uh, planning pathways and um, processes uh, how how to, how it is impacting those. Um, and planning controls. And um, so what the city looked at doing was developing a whole range of mapping of the city, which demonstrate the complexity of an urban environment. Um, and looking at, you know, open space, built form, floor space, precincts, street wall heights, um, even a view analysis, all of those various aspects. Um, and from that level of data, then they translate over into a strategy, which in and of itself, when it's combined together, becomes almost a data set that is now a planning framework that they operate in within um, to approve buildings. And I thought that was interesting just to, to think about how, yes, we have um, sort of these uh, legacy government frameworks that decisions are made within, but um, they're probably the, the remaining artifacts of of how um, of how you know the built environment comes to get, comes together and that we operate in, but over time they will also be impacted by data and they will also be renewed through it as well, and it it, it seems to be that as architects and designers that we are the ones who need to push for that shift to bring data led decision making into into these systems that are um, you know, being uh shifted by technology as well <clears throat> um that then sort of leads to the question around uh what our process is as designers and how that has changed as well and so one of the things that um that i'm interested in is just how we work with data and how we um, engage with it um and and how that's shifting our the way that we that we operate um, this is, uh, I guess, two, two scenes that uh, juxtapose um, the pre-industrial way in which people worked, potentially. So it's, it's fairly emotive, but, um, and then how we, how we work today or how things are manufactured today and that, that contrast. And I think it's interesting just to, to think about those two things and, and what sort of their inherent values are between the two of them as well. Um, and so I guess on, on the left, you have something that's very much, uh, it's very much man-made. It's, it's very much um, uh, in a way, so hands-on and personal as well in the way that people are engaging with that. Um, and then on the right, it's something which is um, mass produced and, um, and almost perfect in its outcome. And that's the intent of, of how it of how it works. And then I start to think about how that shifts to our design process as well. And so on the left, you have um, the typical or traditional um, architectural drawing drafting um, studio. And then I tried to think of how maybe I work um, today and how that would be represented. And the best I could come up with was thousands of tabs open, um, and even tabs or windows inside windows of how I 
am kind of constantly working across different platforms and looking at different inputs. I think the key thing about how different these two approaches are is um, firstly the the inspiration behind the work. Um, in sort of the traditional sense, it was very much about what you directly engaged with in your physical space. Uh, and then and then secondly, it was this hands-on approach of you drawing every single drawing and engaging with your design in a really personal way. Uh, and then leading to how we might work today is this inspiration coming from absolutely everywhere, but then also at the same time, um, this automation of the web that we work and that we can generate thousands of options. And so it, it's level of, of my input towards it is, is sort of changed in, 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 that, in that way as well. Um, and, then, and then looking at that, um, how does that impact the design of cities and how does that impact um, or, or change the way in which uh, we view our role as designers of cities? Um, and then so on the left here, obviously, it's, uh, it's looking at um, Le Corbusier's uh, vision of Paris and, and then, um, and then the, the actual current day. Um, and in a way, one of them is an autocratic uh, design process of um, one person's vision that has been executed. And the other is a democratic process of hundreds of different lots all coming together with their own unique um, their own unique sort of position and then forming a city um, with this sort of collective vision um, or collective process, uh, more democratic, if you could say. Um, and, and both of them obviously have their qualities that are, that are attractive to certain, to certain um, ways of thinking. But I think that um, we as designers are operating um, inherently in a democratic process. We don't have total control over our over the outcomes. And so how can we engage with that um, and influence that? And how does data help us do that? Thanks. And, uh, and uh, it, it all, it all, uh, maybe uh, I hear myself, maybe, yeah, thanks. Uh, it all boils down to uh, uh, to one of the key questions, right? That we're trying to think of. Uh, especially when uh, we look at uh, a bigger context like uh, like a city, is what makes a design good, or however you design define uh, a good or a bad, uh, which is actually a, a, in a way a very complex construct, uh, and it, it it changes over time in the way we uh, can address the question of how we see good. Is it only uh, spatially good or is it uh, good because it benefits the largest amount of people uh, from that design? Uh, especially when we look at it at, at the planning scale, or the urban design scale, uh, it's essential to think of the, 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 the broadness of the users that might uh, value the, the qualities that the, those different spaces have, uh, whether they are part of buildings or, or part of open spaces or the integration of, of, uh, of those two uh, into a, a city concept. And digital uh, helps us to understand and define um, in new ways uh, what actually good and bad means. Next slide, please. Um, and that is necessary. Uh, that is necessary because uh, uh, we're going through a period where we have uh, many issues that need to be resolved and digital or the availability of data may help us in new ways to think about solutions for these problems. Um, whether or not it is uh, this uh, set of numbers that you see on the screen, uh, that is focused on, I think, Southeast Asia, if I'm not mistaken. I think this is um, the World Bank report, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, or an ADB report. Yeah, ADB. Um, showcasing the need for solutions uh, for large quantities of people living in and around cities uh, in different parts of the world. Um, and how data can actually uh, play a role in finding the best solutions and defining, therefore, what is a good solution uh, for those specific needs. Next slide, please. Um, and we might do that uh, in a traditional form based on experience, the way we've learned from doing previously. 
uh, in terms of uh, uh, dealing with problems and how we respond to um, potential solutions. We know that certain things work well and therefore we apply them. Um, but there are limitations to that way and digital uh, or the availability of data may help us um, surpass some of these constraints that we have. Thinking, for instance, in new ways on how to uh, look at regenerative design, because we know more about embodied or operational carbon um, uh, from the future product, or even make decisions based on several optioneering uh, uh, options that we have during the optioneering phase uh, in a process uh, in making any decisions towards what the right solution or the good solution might be for a specific problem. Next slide, please. Uh, and that, need, that, that leads us to thinking again about uh, the role of um, data in the design process. Um, if we simplify that design process from the establishment of a certain kind of need, whether that is very pragmatic or um, a very social need, towards the end product, an outcome uh, of either a space or, or a, another form of a product, uh, and the way that data is gathered uh, in that entire process and data is being used in that entire process to make decisions. So thinking from uh, need, the translation into a brief of requirements uh, with which uh, professionals will aim to find solutions for specific problems that are identified in that brief. They will go through a process of research, understanding what those problems are and how they could be addressed, thinking of identifying issues and opportunities for specific processes. Going through a, uh, a conceptual design phase in which uh, a preliminary design is conceived, uh, a model is being generated, and then a test is being done uh, within which uh, is being verified if the desired outcomes actually um, uh, are being delivered. And the um, outcome of the development proposal uh, um, enhances the conditions set out in the brief. Uh, and the availability of data lets us think uh, really differently about this process and, and allows us to test ourselves on what actually is a good design uh, and how do we uh, understand the outcomes of a design even in the phases after it leaves our drawing board or our, our computer screen uh, and manifest itself into the real world uh, in the form of either space or a building or, or any other form that there is, uh, still uh, being able to be tested uh, and verified if it reaches uh, the, the, the proper outcomes that are being uh, set out in the initial brief originally. Next slide, please. And you see that the, the, both the research and the test phase here uh, are very much data driven uh, and play a very uh, important role in, in thinking iteratively about what is that good design. Is it, is it the design that the designer says, okay, this is what we think is good, or is there a data driven approach behind it, which allows us to further elaborate on which elements of this proposal are good and how they a respond to certain types of needs within um, uh, the, the either mentioned in the brief or in the in the set of needs in the beginning. Next slide, please. Uh, and thinking about that further, uh, it's 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 also a mind shift in changing uh, uh, from a purely outcome based uh, delivery of products. Think of sections, plans, drawings, etc. Uh, towards thinking in, uh, uh, in, a, in a form of logic, thinking in patterns, uh, providing a consistent language to um, address um, small portions of, uh, of uh, understanding problems and potential solutions to it. If you click next slide, please. Uh, it's not something new. It's something that uh, is uh, part of a way that is uh, thought through already quite a long time ago, Christoph Alexander. I, I, I think you might be all familiar with it. Uh, if not, please read it. Um, and, and next slide, please. Uh, and it, 
especially the way we now think about automation in the design process requires us to think differently about patterns, perhaps not directly the patterns that Christoph Alexander uh, identifies in his book, uh, but the way we can see uh, patterns in terms of methodology and the way we work with data processing and analysis in our work. Um, and that changes the mindset from uh, the original way that we deliver our proposal, uh, our delivery of our um, data set uh, in the form of uh, a drawing or a section, or uh, if it is during construction in the form of a building, where the process uh, is quite a linear process in which we um, bring together different bits and pieces of the puzzle to be solved, uh, imagined uh, in the uh, intent in the beginning, masterminded, let's say that, uh, and um, uh, then output in a, in a single data set. Um, but if we apply um, new ways of working, uh, in this process, we uh, allow uh, that logic to be defined uh, throughout that process. We allow knowledge that we have, uh, that, that, that we possess either of experience or of the site or, or by learning uh, to play an important role in providing input to a uh, defined logic process, which all allows multiple outcomes uh, and um, uh, outcomes that might be uh, real-time changeable. Think, uh, for instance, if the way we work with Grasshopper or, or Dynamo uh, in our design process in a way we can change parameters that are sometimes uh, decided upfront in the beginning uh, and allow for immediate outcomes to come out in different formats um, uh, within a matter of minutes often. It allows us to think of the outputs, uh, the data sets that come out of it, in a very different way, uh, not in the forms directly of, of drawings and plans, but in the forms of uh, uh, data set that contain certain information. Uh, think of BIM models, uh, uh, um, multiple formats of that, uh, and the way that these can then be transferred into drawings or diagrams or etc. Next slide, please. Um, and that's, uh, that's, of course, quite an, uh, a change in the way we work. Uh, and while not taking away uh, the, let's say, the role of the designer as the driver behind the process, uh, and that is something that needs to be uh, uh, very upfront, the decision making is still uh, part of the designer uh, interpreting the data, uh, how it is being presented uh, to and from the logic process, uh, let's say in a common uh, data uh, development platform where we work together with different disciplines um, uh, in a variety of assessments to understand uh, what the performance against specific key indicators would be uh, of um, a certain moment or a certain proposal that there is, which allows us to uh, challenge the way we think uh, a design is good or uh, and challenges us to come up with new solutions. Thanks. Um, yeah, and, and I guess um, just of what Matt was talking about now, um, it does challenge the way in which we see our role within the design process and within influencing. And if um, we reflect on uh, that framework that we actually operate with more political or the decision-making framework that, that our designs have to navigate. Um, it starts to bring more focus on why we use data and how we use it and when, um, and bring more onus on us to be more agile in our approach. Um, and so data or this sort of, this sort of insights from data or the tools that we, that we use to start to shape a design, needs to be agile and in a way a plug and play sort of uh, approach. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, you can start to develop up tools that you know work sort of pieces of logic from previous projects and then know when to plug them in to a project and when, and when to use them. 
Um, and along that process, um, you know, there needs to be some sort of a flow that connects that connects that narrative together. So as much as you're using the initial stages to define the metrics, even just a broad sweep of, um, of analysis that you might do, because honestly, the if you if you look at it, then you if you really want to understand a project um, or, or or a site, there's going to be this sort of broad uh, broad set of analysis that that everyone sort of goes through. But from that is where you can start to um, ask more specific questions and find more specific metrics that will define your project. And then moving forward, taking those metrics with you to a testing phase. Um, that you can actually test what your project is doing and how it's working and seeing that there's a line of sight between those two. And then that is something that informs the, uh, as you judge the, uh, the, the, the options or the outcomes. Um, and so something that uh, I've been really interested in is just the different types of analysis tools or urban analysis tools that um, would drive a project. Um, so you obviously have your typical sort of climate weather data analysis, um, and that has driven a lot of projects, especially from a sort of sustainability um, point of view as well, from a building point of view. Uh, and then how does that translate further out from into, into a urban environment? Um, maybe it's a microclimate analysis rather than just looking at climatic or weather conditions to a building. Um, but then there's also this uh, ability to be able to operate or draw data that's um, not just sort of weather or climatic, but um, social and understand how people are engaging with the existing in the existing space or what's driving certain behaviors as well. Um, and then like, and then looking at that even from a post occupancy level. So how does your design perform? What, what impacts has that change had? Um, but then I think another interesting um, element that we have um, to use as designers now is um, being able to engage with the existing fabric in much more meaningful way. So using advanced LiDAR tools or having really accurate digital twins that allow us to be able to work with the existing fabric and not look at sites as sort of a, a um, flat or blank canvas, but start to work with the elements that are there in a much more meaningful way. Um, and then, and then something that I've been looking at recently as well is just um, a broader list of or categories of different different tool sets that might impact urban analysis. So, um, think often typically you know looking at sites or um, you know weather and those sorts of things are, are the typical sorts of data that you might look at, but um, energy use, resilience, social um, metrics. Um, transport, how people are moving through space, um, and then also health as well, and uh, understanding um, the impacts that that it might have on ecosystems, um, uh, water, uh, and other sort of health metrics as well. So all of these things um, can provide a lot more um, evidence behind a design and, and help to start to target certain questions as well. Um, and so just a snapshot about some of those digital tools that um, Arab is looking at. Um, and, and each of these sort of has their own application and you need to sort of have that at your disposal that you know when, when is the right time to, to implement. But um, things like uh, 3D Inspect, which is that um, sort of digital twin um, that's, that's highly accurate and detailed or um, terrain analysis like landslide assessments, um, digital land use analysis tools. So looking at a city, um, getting that uh, uh, data out of, out of say a, a scan or a LIDAR um, information and then being able to, to start to pull analysis out of it. Um, even climate change modeling. So not relying on existing weather um, on existing weather data to, to drive your design, but looking at future climate change weather data that, that you can sort of play with the metrics to, to understand different, different scenarios. Um, all of these things are uh, tools that, um, that you could plug and play at a certain point in time. Um, if you have a specific question or something specific that you need to, to, to drive your, 
design um, process. Thanks. In the in the last couple of minutes, um, I'll walk you through some of the applications um, or the way we apply uh, some of our digital tools throughout the process. Um, and then we'd like to come back to uh, the, the main topic of today is the critical thinking process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'll walk a bit more quick through this. Uh, this is one of the tools that uh, Arab developed uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, it was a tool developed uh, in uh, the previous Arab office where I was in Hong Kong, um, uh, which uh, looks at the proper spacing uh, of mainly uh, different transport nodes. So think, for instance, of metro stations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and in that uh, tool, mass motion, you see um, how uh, characteristics of behavior of people are being captured. Um, through uh, uh, the, the, in this case, the visualization of that data uh, in order to make decisions on uh, proper spacing, proper allocation, or uh, the proper uh, um, um, uh, location of signage, for instance, throughout uh, buildings or, or train stations or, or other um, mostly public transport um, uh, um, uh, assets. Uh, it allows to better understand uh, behavior uh, of people and the need for specific solutions in, in, in specific locations. Next slide, please. This tool actually uh, was being used in, in many different um, um, assets, uh, uh, buildings, uh, not only uh, in uh, rail um, uh, assets, but think for us, instance, also in airport or libraries, or even at the bigger scale in, in terms of urban design areas. Next slide, please. Um, but uh, the tool has, has developed further uh, in the last couple of years because it was a uh, good base to think about the way we uh, measure uh, uh, the in impacts of social distancing during COVID period. So it allows us to think differently and work with clients on proper solutions for a socially distanced operation of their assets. Uh, um, uh, the the uh, the way that space is being used and um, uh, the way that proper distance can be retained uh, while the premises are in use. Next slide, please. Uh, which has led to a uh, to a, uh, a further development of that tool um, uh, in in terms of um, uh, looking at. Uh, COVID-related um, um, uh, services uh, around, uh, around this tool. Next slide, please. Um, this is something uh, uh, very different, but very down to earth. Uh, this is uh, investigations that we have been doing. I think, Mohammed, you'll, you'll recognize some things of it uh, in terms of trying to understand uh, how to work with uh, different forms of multi-criteria analysis. Um, this is a snapshot of a, of, a, of a simple area, but looking at three key indicators and the performance of these indicators and how they uh, might influence each other. Uh, and it's something that we use in our uh, decision-making process, uh, setting out a whole variety of different indicators um, and looking at, uh, at the benefits and drawbacks of, uh, of specific options. Next slide, please. Uh, and the last uh, tool I, I wanted to highlight um, is a building management or asset management tool. Um, since in the beginning of this, uh, this presentation, we started with the fact that information allows us to make different decisions. Uh, and uh, Arab Neuron is, uh, um, is something developed um, and a couple of years ago, I think, three, four years ago, um, in, uh, in our Arab offices uh, with multiple offices. Uh, here you see the application within the Arab office in uh, Hong Kong uh, of uh, um, the, the, the asset management tool. It's a very broad tool uh, that allows for information gathering of uh, the, the um, um, uh, the flow of information that comes out of uh, the use of different assets. 
um, and how these can actually drive uh, decisions around uh, upgrading uh, need for um, immediate solutions or long-term solutions. Next slide, please. Um, it's a very broad tool uh, that uh, lets us think differently about the way we deliver our, our BIM products um, so that they can tie in with, for instance, Arab Neuron. Uh, but uh, interestingly, also this tool has been widely used during the pandemic in terms of health monitoring uh, of not only the building, but actually of the residents within the building. I think on the next slide, I have an example of that as well. Uh, yes, uh, where um, specific sensors uh, were connected to the dashboard. Um, and uh, in case of, um, um, especially at the beginning of the COVID period, um, uh, data could be captured um, around uh, potential risks. Um, um, specific building components could uh, therefore be uh, made online uh, or different flows of air um, could be circulated in different um, um, outflow areas. Next slide, please. It uses uh, artificial intelligence to, uh, um, uh, to come up with the, the, the most proper solution or the most proper outcome. Yeah, and, and I think um, just, uh, I suppose, how that might tie back, like all of those different toolkits and, and that, that approach, it's really about being agile in the process, uh, the design process. So um, this slide here is, highlighting the complexity of the planning systems in, um, in Australia. Um, so uh, I guess the worst offender here would be New South Wales with over 500 different planning schemes to, in, to interface with. Um, and I, I think I just, uh, just wanted to illustrate um, that as much as we have these, this process that we work within, we actually are uh, working within a much broader governance system. Um, and that requires us to be much more agile in how we target the use of data to be able to um, create as much influence as we can over, over projects. Um, and so each, uh, I suppose, each uh, uh, set of data is only um, valuable in, in a certain, to a certain extent. Um, and that's where the multi-criteria um, assessment uh, is, is an important part of, um, of looking at it, rather than having your design weighted heavily into one, into one um, category. It needs to be able to um, balance across, uh, you know, multiple constraints and even be able to, um, even be able to shift um, uh, rapidly to be able to accommodate uh, unknown futures as well. Uh, and so, um, and so, as much as there's a need to sort of create this sort of broader um, process that really needs to be agile that you can plug in um, in different uh, uh, tools as along the way and, and understand that at what time to 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 start to to toggle um, on and off different different inputs. Um, but yeah, I think we had uh, some questions and things for the group. Um, but I don't know, Matt, if you wanted to wrap up around critical thinking. Yeah, I, I, I think the main, uh, uh, since technology is changing so rapidly, right? Um, in, in a matter of years, the, uh, the application of a, a certain tool uh, might be outdated, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very much about the role of the designer within that process uh, and uh, the way that the, the designer, um, the, the shifting skill sets of the designer uh, and, uh, and, and how the different tools are being implemented throughout that process. Um, I think that leads us to uh, a couple of questions, maybe perhaps as a teaser to start a discussion. Um, um, if, if, if there are any questions, of course, uh, it's also fine. But uh, some questions that I think are, are very relevant to ask is what, what skills would uh, a designer need nowadays um, in comparison to the traditional, let's say, design skills? Uh, are they about uh, programming or are they about uh, a broader context within uh, where, where programming plays a, a role as well? Um, are they around decision making and critical thinking uh, around such tools, for instance? Um, 
of course, it also allows us to think and discuss broadly about how should our practice, our design practice, adapt to maximize influence, uh, the way that decisions are being made, the way that we think about good projects versus less good or bad projects. Um, it allows us to think of, uh, of the design process itself. If we think only internally, um, uh, has, that, has there been a shift in the design process and the way we look at uh, the way we design, um, not dismissing the role of paper and pen throughout the design process. Um, the role of the designer, of course, as traditionally the mastermind uh, versus a, a more uh, data-driven, uh, uh, critical design uh, designer role. Uh, and of course, uh, the influence of data and the designers behind uh, those data sets uh, in the existing governance systems. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, technology evolves very rapidly. Uh, coming back to the main question that we're uh, perhaps uh, wanting to discuss also today is the role of education uh, to keep up with such rapid changes. I think I would be happy to discuss any questions you might have. Uh, if not, uh, these are our, our teasers. Superb. Thanks so much. That was actually fascinating. Um, I think one, one massive advantage of being the moderator of a lecture is that I get first dibs on the first question, regardless of how many questions there are. So I'm going to start with one, um, mainly because a lot of the things that you're touching on are things that I've kind of have seen, have observed, have seen more and more um, acceptance of, of these concepts in practice where about five, six years ago, maybe there was a little bit more hesitancy to take the, these approaches on. So I guess my question to you is kind of twofold, but related to the same query, which is, how do you find this, this integration of data-driven design and all aspects of complexity, improved communication internally between different designers, as well as externally between the design team and the clients? And did that help in any way for improving collaborative work even with a client, which sometimes the client feels that they have more ownership over the design than the designers, but, or did it create a bigger gap between those who have the skills, technical literacy to speak about them and those who don't? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks, yeah, really, really great question. Uh, I think the answer is also uh, twofold, right? Um, in terms of the internal design process, uh, it helps us to understand better uh, the way we make decisions. It helps us better to explain uh, uh, the benefits and drawbacks of, for instance, options that we, or the process that we've gone through to our clients. Um, but we also see quite often uh, that our clients need to um, uh, take the evidence that we give them uh, the evidence towards the decision making uh, as a given, uh, because they might not have insight in the details behind uh, how that uh, decision has been made, uh, how that process has gone through, and how the data behind uh, used within the process has been collected, manipulated, uh, and has evolved into um, um, uh, a recommended solution. Uh, I think the Discussions uh, has therefore changed with our clients from um, uh, uh, often a, a very um, uh, outcome focused uh, discussion towards a much more process based discussion in terms of creating um, collaborative understanding that the solution is the proper solution or that the methodology being used is the right methodology with which to derive um, the most suitable out outcomes. Uh, to give you an example, uh, in Hong Kong, in the, in the process, um, an, an air ventilation assessment is part of the design process of any statutory um, application. Um, that AVA process goes through a very rigid um, set uh, of assessments uh, and only specific tools according to the, the, the government system, are able to deliver that outcome properly. Um, so many of the discussions that we are going through is, for instance, the way that uh, the quality of the output of certain 
non-specific um, AVA tools. Uh, and if they can deliver similar quality outputs that therefore might be deemed acceptable uh, for government uh, approval. Uh, so that the risk that is embedded in approving a certain outcome uh, uh, can be controlled. Uh, and, and I think that that's where the, the uncertainty lies, right? If I don't know the tool, how can I accept that that's the proper outcome? Um, so I think that that communication process um, has has changed from the traditional design process towards speaking much more in detail about methodologies. And that is both internal and, and external. That's fascinating. I, I do have a follow-up question, but I'm going to take a little bit of a backseat here and allow um, the attendees because they're starting to fill in their questions. So I'm going to just start to read these out just so uh, other attendees can listen in. So, um, I'll start with uh, Jackie's question. Um, uh, what percentage would you say data and computationally aided processes is involved in the overall process of designing a project at the moment? <laughs> and just anyway, be kind with your answer because I'm trying to convince <laughs> this specific person <laughs> to integrate more data in his work. So, <laughs> so don't give a small percentage. Uh, anyway, no, no, please be truthful. So yeah, how much, how big of a role do you think that it plays? I think it plays a major role. Uh, maybe, maybe Josh, you can supplement after me. Um, it is, a, but it may not be such a shift as you might call it, because let's say the traditional design process still goes through data collection, data analysis, interpretation of data, and um, the the multi criteria analysis in terms of creating a potential solution. The only thing is, now that we have additional data sets available, uh, we might have a better or more varied insight in um, which, uh, which variables or which indicators play a role in that decision-making process. And we might value, value them differently. We might weigh them differently uh, within that, um, that analysis process. So, I think data plays a very, very important role in our understanding. Uh, data as you might use the word now, data as being the, the computer generated data sets uh, in which you make decisions. Um, yes, it plays an important role, but still the traditional data sets uh, as just interpreting by yourself the survey maps, interpreting by yourself uh, um, data sets around climate, et cetera, et cetera, still play an essential role in the decision-making process. The only thing is uh, uh, in that methodology, you'll need to find a way how to um, combine those traditional methods with those modern methods. Yeah, I might just add to that as well, that I think, with, I think with, when, um, Data and the way that it's utilized, yes, it's it's something that has been a, an input to design, you know, uh, even in sort of traditional methods. Um, but I think that now we have the capacity to be able to string it all the way through the design process and establish metrics at the beginning that, um, that then you can use to test um, at the end or, or throughout. Um, and then because of the ability to be able to draw on, say, um, big data or this, this huge pool of data, uh, and then have your own designs almost have the output data as well, you, you can draw parallels between projects. Um, and so you can start to benchmark what is good um, or what is a good outcome against many projects in, you know, uh, over a course of, of uh, you know, your career as well. As you look at it, you can start to, to benchmark um, cities against each other um, because of the ability to be able to process that level of data. And I think it's really important as well that comment around you know, how you weight things. Um, if just being very mindful of, um, of uh, what you're putting, placing value on and being able to, to articulate that and the reasons why a design has gone in a certain way, rather than just saying it was an outcome of this process. It's an outcome of decision-making along that process. 
Yeah, thanks for, thanks for mentioning that. I think that's a very important uh, uh, topic, right? Uh, data can be overwhelming and uh, can take over uh, your thinking uh, in the design process. Uh, it's it's really essential, and I think that's the message that that uh, we 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 try to embed here in this uh, presentation is uh, the designer is always the, the driver uh, of that vehicle um, that that is that data set. It's still the designer that decides in the end what uh, the right solution will be based on better and more uh, detailed information, uh, a, a, a more accurate analysis, uh, a, a broader analysis, but still it is in the end, the role of the designer to be in control of where that vehicle is going and if it turns right or left. It might come from, uh, if, if we just look at experiences, it might come from very different directions where, uh, in, for instance, one of our processes uh, for a master plan, we came up with the optimal solution uh, based on set of KPIs that we set out uh, until the client said, yes, all very nice, uh, but our company policy is to put more effort on green building design. And therefore we will go for option three and not your proposed option number one. Uh, so think of data as part of the design process uh, while the designer still remains the driver to control that process. That's spot on. I, I completely agree with every word of that. Um, because I think it's also important not to just think about this as just this kind of independent machine and suddenly it becomes less of a democratic process when in reality it is just a tool to further emphasize and support a democratic process, which I, I think is super spot on. On that topic of data and access to that data, I'd like to kind of, and I apologize, you're probably listening to my kids in the background, they're screaming their heads off, but I'll ignore that. Um, Madley's asking about various ways in which we can get, um, access to data, but at more affordable costs. And I think this is a very important topic because uh, as uh, Josh also mentioned, the, we're, we live in unprecedented times where we can actually compare the performance of cities, cities to each other. And that's purely because of our access to data. The problem is that um, as with any capitalist society, there's value there. And so there are people who are trying to kind of privatize that and make access, restrict access to data. So. What, what are your thoughts? Like, how do we, is, is this is this a situation where, look, make as, the data as widely accessible as possible for everyone to benefit from? Or do we also must give credit to the people collecting this data because it's not an easy process to be able to collect the data at a city scale, for example? Yeah, 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 absolutely understand. Um, I think we're going through a transition process at the moment, right, in, in these years where, um, let's say public data uh, is, uh, is a valuable asset uh, to have and to work with. Think, for instance, on the reluctancy often of transport departments to release um, data around uh, uh, road toll uh, systems uh, um, or, or similar kind of, um, um, of information. Uh, think even on uh, uh, information on specific uses of the road by different types of vehicles. Uh, all these data sets are available, but often not yet released to public um, by, especially by government departments. Um, private sector, of course, has a very different motive behind retaining data. Um, I think on the public sector side, uh, we're now going through a learning process where also government departments learn to deal uh, with their data sets, um, uh, learn to understand the value of sharing some of those data sets um, in the end in their favor. Uh, but that is a learning curve that, that needs to be uh, gone through. Uh, and, and as you see already in the last uh, maybe decade, something like that, um, much more open data sources have become available just in a matter of a couple of years. Um, and this is an ongoing process in which we kind of democratize the, the value of public information, uh, especially around city assets. Um, there is, of course, always the some form of privacy issue uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, either it is by aggregation of data sets so that they become anonymized um, in, in some form. 
um, or because of vulnerability of different components of the city. Uh, think, for instance, of metro systems and, and risk to metro systems um, in terms of um, uh, terrorism or, or other forms of threats that the city might need to deal with, or, or even flooding. Um, those are important considerations to think about uh, the, uh, the change from, from keeping the data within your own environment, within your own department, within your own cluster, uh, towards sharing that data, um, either fully public or first to uh, different departments or, or first to consultants at a, um, at a non-disclosure uh, agreement uh, format. Uh, you see that we're now going through, I think, uh, almost everywhere in the world through that process of, of learning how to deal with these issues. So, madly, if you... I agree. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Josh, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, I agree. I think there's, um, there's this uh, shift that's happening, um, and it's probably not fast enough for most people as far as data becoming open, um, but definitely it's a mentality around information and data that is the real barrier here um, around people like the sort of the protection of, of IP, but then also just this, this default of not sharing even within government. Um, I think, I think to, to flip that, we need to look at what the benefits are of sharing data and having open data. But then on the other side, I think as a designer, you can just develop your own data sets. Um, and that is a really powerful tool that, um, you know, there's, you can start with some source data and then develop really insightful data sets off that. Um, so uh, working with your own data and then choosing to share it, um, you know, that's, that probably is more the way in which you could, you could take ownership over that process. I agree completely. And I was just about saying, I'm so glad that you said it first, that. I was going to say to Madly, the person who asked the question, I guess the answer is to be patient. The problem is how patient are you? Um, and I love the fact that, you know, we forget that we can create our own data sets. And I guess when the foot is on the other shoe, then you say, well, all right, I create my own data sets. How quick am I going to share this for free with everyone else? And I guess, you know, then you start to really question that. I have two more questions and then... Um, I'll let you guys go because I know, so for those of you who are zooming in from anywhere other than Australia, it's seven o'clock here and we're slowly eating to the quiet time of Matt and Josh. So um, one last question from the audience and then one last question from me, just because I'm super curious about one specific slide, but from uh, Kushwenia, uh, oh, essentially the question here is, I think it relates to also one of the teaser questions that you ask at the end, which is um, learning all these tools has become overwhelming and i must admit even for like for me i just can't even think about me having to learn grasshopper 2.0 now you know it's just oh, again and so so but the but but the fact is that within a very fast paced world at the moment and i love how you started off the slides with how it was and how it is currently the 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 evolution of these tools is rapid is exponential almost every month, every two months, every six months, every year, we have something else that is doing, trying to do the same thing at a better rate. How do you keep up? Is there, so yeah, like obviously there's internal kind of training and all that stuff, but it's more about how do you kind of maintain a level of sanity when in reality you have to kind of learn a new tool just to keep up with industry or to keep up with the market? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Um, yes, you need to keep up with the market. Yes, the team needs to be able to have those skills on board. Um, no, you don't need to know everything by yourself. Uh, I think that's the key uh, message. Since tools are so rapidly changing, developing, um, it's important to be able to use uh, some of those tools, but it's more important to uh, actually understand the logic behind some of those tools in order to be able to work with, for instance, specialists, um, that can gain a deeper understanding and, and can support you in the decision-making process. And there I would also draw a line between, let's say, the programmer and the designer. Uh, the designer is being aware of the logic behind the tool, uh, the ability to work lightly with the tool. Um, but the most important ability is to uh, make decisions based on the outcomes of that logic. 
whereas the programmer is specialized in writing the code that will allow um, information to be transformed from one format into another format so that the decision making process can continue. Um, and final question, and I think this is now to Josh. Josh, what is, why in the world are there 500 plus planning schemes for NSW, which is fine, I'll accept that, but then there's only one for South Australia. That is mind blowing. So please, I have no idea. This is not a trick question. I just really am so curious about this massive kind of gap between, I'm assuming schemes that are trying to do the same thing, creating better planning mechanisms. Anyway, what are your thoughts on both of you on that? And then we can end it there. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of mind boggling to think about the planning frameworks that we operate in. Um, and what I was trying to do prior to this lecture was find a good way to articulate the complexity of the planning framework. Um, and, and you can look at it just within New South Wales and there's so many different layers within that. Um, but the reason I couldn't find any good way to, or a diagram at hand was because it's constantly changing. Um, to the fact, to the point when no one actually develops a diagram to show it anymore, because that diagram will automatically become uh, old in instantly. Um, but as far as the complexity and how it operates, I think um, I think what is interesting is about uh, the the motivations behind um, a planning framework or, or or a structure or that governance structure. And um, obviously in South Australia, and, and th that was after they reformed. So, so they've recently reformed their planning framework to have one planning scheme. Um, but it's a result of local state government um, levels all having different authority and roles. Um, and I think what's interesting about that is how it, it causes us as designers to, be, to have to be very agile in the way that we respond to this decision-making um, process, that we need to be able to develop tools that are almost universal in how they could be applied, but then agile that they can be, they can they could slot into different scenarios and still be relevant. And I think that um, that's sort of the challenge. You can't, if, if you think that you can create this one-stop shop sort of tool that's going to solve your problem, then, the planning framework may just, you know, uh, update, you know, in the following week and all of a sudden your tool is redundant. Um, but also looking at just geographically or politically across, across just Australia, the diversity that's there means that your, your tool, if it's, if it's like this complete tool, is never actually complete. It only applies to one small area or one small zone. And so it's, it's looking at you have to break it down to these pieces that then you can you can slot in, um, but then you also need to understand the broader system and and how and where and how to influence that system. Um, that's great, and I think that is a testament to the slide that you had of a snapshot of the tools that Arab uses. Like each one of the, like I spend my entire life focusing on just one of those, and to imagine that you know you have the like. That's what's needed, and I think that's a testament to 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 the progression of, of of this field and the involvement of kind of all these kind of data and metrics in the design process. Um, all right, it's seven fifteen. We're fifteen minutes over. Of course, I've never ever finished any of these lectures on time, so I apologize. But I so immensely thank both of you for giving up your time, and I know how busy you are, Matt, because. I like, anyway, I won't say why, but I know how busy you are. <laughs> so Sorry. I'm so, so very grateful so for, for you being able to, to make the time for this lecture. I think um, testament to both of you, um, the attendee list, you guys now hold the record. I've never had any of these lectures had an attendee list with this high. So congratulations, unless it's broken next week. Um, enjoy this one week of, of, of you holding the record. But again, <laughs> thank you very much for your time. This was a superbly insightful lecture that I think touched on a lot of different parts of the usefulness of data, but from a critical perspective for not only urban planning, urban design, but I think all types of design 
Um, and it's so refreshing to see you talk about it in such a kind of um, critical way that makes sure that we don't just get driven by the tool, but we're still in control of the tool. Um, and that's something that I will take back to my studio for sure when we meet next. But also I'm hoping that when you guys come to studio to for a review to share or to assess the student's work based on that perspective. Um, again, thank you very much. We, I really appreciate it. And for, for those of you who are in attendance, if you can join me in giving a virtual clap to the attendees, thanks again. Thanks, thanks a lot for the invitations. I, I think our pleasure to be able to join uh, this, uh, this set of lectures and awesome. uh, definitely looking forward to dial in for the next set of lectures to, to hear what, uh, what the other topics are going to be. Can't wait, can't wait. Josh, again, thank you very much. Nice, thanks again. See you later, See you everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.